It is my honor to be able to introduce our next speaker, and I will say really our keynote speaker. Uh, Dr. Alexander Hiesel is a professor of obstetrics and the director of the Tommy Stillbirth and Research Center at the University of Manchester, United Kingdom. He operates the internationally renowned Rainbow Clinic for parents who have experienced a stillbirth in a previous pregnancy. And I would just like to add that he really is the motivation for the symposium. Our goal was to have Alex share with us his expertise, share with other caregivers in the United States, our hope is to be able to emulate what he has done. So thank you very much for being here. Thank you so much um, for that introduction and also for the invitation to come and talk to you today um, about um, previous stillbirth. This is um, something I feel very passionately about and also how we need to improve the care um, that we provide to mums and dads in their subsequent pregnancy. So, why a previous stillbirth is important moving forward is that we know that mums have an increased risk of complications in a subsequent pregnancy, but also that embarking and navigating through another pregnancy it has big psychological effects. So mums have increased anxiety and stress, and that can feed forward into how they bond with their baby. And we also know that stress has um, an impact on the, on the medical uh, outcome of pregnancy so all of this is important and quite often mums are told that you know lightning can't strike twice don't worry about it just have normal care and nothing bad will happen and unfortunately for some of those families that's not the correct thing that they should be told and really the best data that we have um, on this comes from a systematic review and meta-analysis. And for those of you who aren't aware what a systematic review and meta-analysis is, this is when we search rigorously for all of the studies on a given topic, and then we combine the data. So actually this study pulled together 16 different studies that had over 3.4 million pregnancies worth of data. And 99.3% of these mums had a previous live birth and 07 had a stillbirth. And what they showed is that sadly, 2.5% of mums that had a history of stillbirth went on to have another stillbirth compared to only 0.4% of mums that had a live birth. Now that means that mums who have had history of stillbirth have um, about a 4.8 fold increased risk of having stillbirth in a subsequent pregnancy. And a way of expressing this is by this thing that's called a forest plot. And each of the studies is a dot, is one line and a dot on this graph. This solid line in the middle here, that's if there was no effect at all of having a previous stillbirth. This dotted line here is the mean effect of all the studies. And what you can see is actually the studies, although they varied a bit, actually had a very consistent estimate. So we do know that, you know, women being told that lightning can't strike twice and having their concerns not heard in a subsequent pregnancy really isn't accurate from the data that we have. And Mered Black in 2008 looked um, at mums that had a previous stillbirth and showed that they had an increased risk of preeclampsia, of prematurity, of low birth weight, of placental abruption, but also of things that we do um, as, as clinicians, so inducing labour. So some of those risks are probably innate and they relate to things that Marta, Elspeth and Beatrix have told us about because we know that um, placental disorders can recur. But some of those um, are because of how we look after mums. So why do complications recur? Well, mum's medical conditions may be there still. So if you're already hypertensive, if you've already got diabetes, then those will continue. But there are specific conditions that can occur again in another pregnancy. And um, when we looked at the different placental disorders, you can see the things that we found that recurred were problems with mum's circulatory disorders, babies, and also inflammatory placental conditions. And there's also potentially genetic conditions. So knowing all of that, what are women's experiences in subsequent pregnancy? Am I colleague Tracy Mills did um, a systematic review of qualitative studies. So these are studies that talk about parents' experiences. And when we looked at these, there are actually 14 studies that we were able to include. None were from the UK, 
a fair few actually were from the US. Um, but are we able to pull out three main themes about what it's like to have a pregnancy after loss? The first is that you have a coexistence of emotions. There's grief for the baby that you've lost, but also hope that this baby will be well. Often parents are very isolated for friends and family because they say things like, oh, well, this will replace the baby that you have lost. This will take those feelings away, which is an attempt to be helpful, but actually is one of the most unhelpful things that can happen. Parents can do things to try and cope. So often mums delay attachment with their baby. They may seek far more control than they did in their first pregnancy. And also parents seek reassurance through interactions. And that's with care providers. So that could be pathologists. It could be midwives. It could be obstetricians and gynecologists. It could be family practitioners. Also interaction with their baby. I think mums are much more aware of their baby's movements and the pattern of movements in pregnancies after loss. And also interaction with technology. So things like ultrasound scanning. Now, when you try and pull all of that data together, you make this thing called line of argument synthesis, which is really a great big sentence. But this sums up what women's experiences are. So that the prior loss profoundly alters the reality of subsequent pregnancies. And to survive, women, uh, women have to think about how they're going to manage this, this new pregnancy. Um, Often health professionals try and meet parents' needs by providing additional antenatal appointments and, and ultrasound surveillance, but it only provides limited assurance. And what we really need to do is to provide adequate emotional and psychological support. When we looked at this in an international survey of over 2,700 parents, most parents conceived again within a year. There were very big variations in care but additional antenatal visits and scans were provided for over two thirds of parents. Um, but we were still not good at addressing psychosocial needs. Um, interestingly, parents who had a late stillbirth were much more likely to have additional care rather than mums who lost a baby less than 30 weeks. And this might be due to the perception of loss or the cause of the loss. And this is just this charted out from this paper, obviously, UK and Ireland is of interest to me in Rainbow Clinic, but you can see actually wasn't that different to what was experienced in um, North America. However, there's not very many studies of pregnancy after loss clinics. There's this one study from Brisbane in Australia. There were 10 mums, all of whom had a live baby in their next pregnancy. And it came up with seven themes that particularly talked about the unique experience of a first pregnancy after loss, the support that was available from the pregnancy after loss clinic and the experiences of other services, but some which were good, some which were really bad. So um, we jointly led um, a, an international consensus statement from a team in Canada and a team in Manchester. And there was a wider group of 27 professionals and parents. And this was a this had a long gestation, three years between an initial workshop in 2015 and we published our consensus guidance in 2018. And it was published um, and endorsed by the International Stillbirth Alliance. And we hope that this is a go to resource for people that want to provide how we look the best care for pregnancy after loss. In essence, this goes right the way back to what Marta and Elspeth have already told you that actually how we provide care in preg next pregnancy goes all the way back to investigations to determine the cause, to make sure that we provided good quality care, which we do at a practice review forum. We then have a perinatal mortality meeting to tell us um, uh, why we think the baby died. We then feed that back to parents and then we plan the care in next pregnancy. So ideally, you know what's going to happen in the pregnancy after loss after you've lost your baby. So you're not embarking on that new pregnancy in an unknown way. So what is Rainbow Clinic? Well, Rainbow Clinic is a multidisciplinary specialist clinic dedicated to um, looking after mums who've had a loss in a previous pregnancy. It provides psychological support. It provides continuity of care 
and directory investigations. And in particular, we see women at 17 and 23 weeks, depending on their gestation at loss, for a placental profile. And we share care with relevant services. So that could be diabetes and high blood pressure clinics. It could be a preterm labour clinic, depending on why their baby died. What can we do? Well, actually, there are some really important things that we mustn't shy away from. We need to stop mums and support mums to stop cigarette smoking. Because if you stop smoking before um, in the first trimester of a pregnancy, your risk goes back down to the background of a non-smoker. So we need to be saying to mums, we don't know whether smoking led to your baby dying, but we want you not to smoke in your next pregnancy. And we will support you through nicotine uh, replacement programs um, to, to not do that. We use a lot of aspirin. Aspirin is uh, a, a, a little wonder drug, really. We use 150 milligrams of aspirin once a day at night um, because the meta-analyses suggest that this reduces the risk of perinatal death. And in particular, it seems to reduce the risk of maternal vascular malperfusion. So reduced blood flow from the mum's side of the placenta. And sometimes we use low molecular weight heparin injections when mum has a condition called thrombophilia, which makes her blood more sticky. And there are other, um, other things that we sometimes do. Now, Elspeth has told you about very clever MRI scanning. And I think, you know, in the long term, that's going to probably be quite helpful to us. At the moment, what we need to do is to use the tools that we have at the moment. And what we have is ultrasound. And we do loads of ultrasound. But what we don't do is we don't do ultrasound of the placenta. And so what we do in Rainbow Clinic is we do measure the baby. We look at the, that. But we also look at how big the placenta is, what it looks like under the ultrasound scanner, the blood flow through the umbilical cord, and the blood flow through the uterine artery Doppler. And that tells us about how well and how normally the placenta is developed. And it means that we can time ultrasound scans um, appropriately moving forward in the next pregnancy. And Rainbow Clinic, when we set it up in 2013, we set it up in one hospital. And um, we looked before we set it up and we looked at um, 294 mums that had a stillbirth in our hospital. And 84 of them had one completed pregnancy. And you can see that in their next pregnancy, sadly, two mums had another stillbirth, which is a 2% stillbirth rate, just like the meta-analysis suggested there would be. One of them didn't seem to be related at all. It was a mum that had a lethal congenital abnormality in her first pregnancy and growth restriction and umbilical cord accident in her second. The other one, no cause was identified, but actually in her second pregnancy, she had growth restriction and antiphospholipid syndrome. When we went back and had a more detailed look, there were signs there um, that, um, that that was happening already. 21% of mums had a baby before 37 weeks in their next pregnancy. So when we'd run Rainbow Clinic for a year, we looked at what had happened and we saw a range of mums. We saw 84 mums. One of them had had, so in 70 had had one stillbirth, five had had two stillbirths and nine had had a mixture of neonatal death, late miscarriages or termination for fetal abnormality. On average, mums saw us for only five appointments 60% had aspirin and one in eight had low molecular weight heparin injections. There were no recurrent stillbirths or neonatal deaths. And actually, as our data have moved forward, we've now seen 900 women in Rainbow Clinic in our hospital. And we have only had three stillbirths or neonatal deaths. Our neonatal and stillbirth rate in our, in our high risk population is now lower than it is in our general obstetric population. Our average gestation became 37 weeks and our preterm birth rate is now only one in 10 babies. We were so struck by this, we rolled out to our neighbouring hospital and after an initial period of getting used to the new protocols and doing things differently, we actually then began to see the preterm birth rate falling across the board again down to one in 10. And you can see here in terms of comparison to the published data, from um, the study in Aberdeen in 2008, 
we can see we tend to have slightly fewer inductions of labor. We have fewer preterm births and a slightly higher elective cesarean section rate. In terms of our patient experience, we've been able to devise a patient experience tool and the top score possible is 25. And we have now been able to score consistently more than 80%, so 20 out of 25 um, since the, the third quarter of 2016. And the variation that we see between parents is decreasing. And when we have analyzed the qualitative data, essentially it's about time, it's about understanding the need for a specialist service. We identify parents' notes by having a special sticker so people don't make mistakes with communication. Um, and it's about knowledge and experience. And we've now been able to scale up and evaluate in Rainbow Clinic. So actually, we're now active in 20 UK hospitals and we've worked um, with the team um, in New York and we're really passionate about helping this happen in the US. Um, we've got this amazing dashboard now so that every site can see how they sit relative to all the other sites. So we can look at how babies are born, whether they're born early, how many visits mums have had to the unit. Um, and we're now establishing a Rainbow Clinic online hub. So in summary, the Rainbow Clinic model of care was developed from high grade evidence showing the increased risk of subsequent stillbirth and psychological problems. We've established what we think is the best practice. And in our experience in the UK, um, in Greater Manchester, implementing this model of care improves pregnancy outcomes and reduces anxiety. And we're now, as I say, rolling out to 20 units across the UK. Um, and we've set up a new study, the National Rainbow Clinic Study, which continues to collect process and outcome measures so that we can be sure that we continue to offer mums the best possible care in pregnancies after loss. Um, I really thank you for your attention. Doing this by Zoom is such an unusual experience, but it is great because it means I can join you from the UK and sit on Saturday afternoon. Um, I'm just pleased I've managed to get through my whole presentation without one of my three children flying through the door. Um, and um, I'd just like to thank uh, all of the people who have helped us um, either roll out the clinic or get data that I've presented today. Um, Tommy's, who are the charity who have um, really enabled us to conduct this work, and our own hospital, who have been um, very supportive in developing um, this innovation. Um, so that when we have moved from a sense that does this clinic need to exist at all to um, you know, wow, actually, this is a clinic that can make um, a difference um, to mums and their partners and babies. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much for that just incredible presentation. You guys have done such an amazing job in the UK, and we hope to be able to emulate all the amazing work that, that you've done. Mm -hmm.